Is 2019 the year petrol met its match? Is the Italian stallion a pony? The Lambo now lame. Are today's best cars electric? Is now the time for us all to switch? Hello and welcome to a special edition of Click. Not Top Gear, although there are shades of that I have to say, but no, this week we're not talking about petrol cars like these, we are talking about electric cars like these. Not hybrid, not hydrogen or anything else, this week it is pure electric. Sure there are other ways to power your car which are good for the environment, go check them out by all means, but this is the year that all electric has really taken off. More people are thinking about EVs than ever before. So in this show, we are asking, is now the right time to switch? We'll look at the cost of buying and running them, how far they can go, and ask if they're as clean and green as they might seem. Mark is going to be going for the ride of his life and he's going to be helping to track down what happens to batteries when we're done with them. And Dan is going to be reporting on the shiny new models coming to a showroom near you soon. But first, here's Lara with a reminder of how we got here. In recent times, all electric took off with the rise of Tesla. 2007 saw its first car, the Roadster. And yes, that's Dan in the passenger seat. 2011 saw Nissan and Mitsubishi create much more affordable all-electric cars, the Leaf and My EV, and yes, that's Spencer in the driving seat. But since then, it's been a bit stop-start for all-electric. Ford killed off its Focus Electric last year, and General Motors has had limited success with the Chevrolet Bolt. And although Renault launched the popular Zoe, many other big European car makers have been quieter than an electric motor until this year. History lesson done. OK, Dan has been to see Europe's all-electric fight back at this year's Frankfurt Motor Show. There was really only one big question for the big execs of the huge German car companies at the world's biggest motor show. Why are they 10 years behind Tesla in offering us an all-electric car? We are not each time the fastest or the earliest, but if we come, we come very strong. Tesla, a company that has been solely focused on electric vehicle production, has, you have to give them credit for blazing the trail. Um, but if you look at other entries on the marketplace from other companies that also do normal cars, so to say, um, this is really the first time you're getting long range, um, fully usable, everyday usable electric vehicles coming from mainstream manufacturers. Right, so they wanted to ace it. Well, the stakes are high. Electric may only represent less than 3% of all new car sales last year, but VW have taken a close look at them and reckon it's the future. Well, it's obviously not real. These cool designs are actually for the future. Maybe. Each car manufacturer brings out some concept ideas. Interestingly, on the Volkswagen stand, they were all electric. The real car they were launching was the ID3, a sort of electric golf, with a 205 to 340 mile range, depending on the exact model, with prices starting from a competitive 30,000 euros. And a first from VW. They'll guarantee the battery for eight years, meaning that if it loses more than a quarter of its full charge when new, they'll replace it. But will car buyers trust a firm that swindled the world when it lied about the illegal level of harmful emissions its own diesel cars spat out? Ah, we invested a lot, really, to fulfill our commitment to the CO2 targets. And it's not just only the CO2 targets during driving. For example, the battery cells after a normal life cycle of a car, which is mainly eight years, nine years, 
the battery cells are still healthy and you can use them, for example, for a second life. We will offer the customer in not all, but most of the uh, European countries, we are able to offer contract to use green energy also during the driving. Audi hasn't done much in the way of electric for the past 10 years either, although now they have this. Sorry, that's another concept car. Now they have this. They've started with the popular style family SUV, but at more than £70,000, can many families afford it? Yeah, I think there is this perception in the market that I have to pay more for the electric version of the same size vehicle than I would for gas or diesel. Um, I think what you're going to see is that, at least by, at Audi, we're going into a lot lower segments in order to make electri uh, electrification much more affordable. But there aren't many families that could afford 90,000 euros for a car. Sure they are. The e-tron started selling this year and has a range of 320 miles and will be joined by a sportier, more expensive electric GT model next year with a mid-range SUV, think sort of Q3, slated for 2021. Over at Mercedes I found something much more affordable. The new Smart EQ42 Cabrio blows your hair rather than the budget at a smidge over £25,000 but will struggle to do a 90-mile round trip without plugging in. It joins their EQC offering, which I'm told will be joined by over half a dozen more all-electric models next year. But surely some things will never lose the roar of a combustion engine. Now, when Land Rover decide to make the Defender electric, well, <laughs> then you know there's a trend going on. It also updates its own software over the air. Even the good old-fashioned black cab, here seen in white, has made the jump to electric, with 20,000 expected to sell across Europe next year, costing drivers less to run. Wonder if taxi fares will fall too. And then there are the sports cars. Lamborghini told me they have no intention of releasing an all-electric model anytime soon. Ferrari, who weren't showing, have a hybrid plan for 2022, but not an all-electric. So it fell to Porsche to take everyone's breath away. And they did. The Taycan is Porsche's first all-electric car, and it shifts. 0 to 62 in 3.2 seconds, with a range of up to 279 miles and a guarantee on that battery. OK, it's £115,000, but that's a 12K saving on its petrol performance equivalent, the 911 actual turbo. Good value, maybe, but I have a feeling that it's that VW that'll turn out to be super competitive as an entry model for most. Talking of competition, we saw Porsche's entry into the electric car market in Dan's report there, but we wanted to test for ourselves just how quick an electric car could be. So we've set up a race. This is a Lamborghini Huracan Super Trofeo. Its V10 petrol engine delivers over 600 horsepower. It's up against a saloon car from Tesla, the Model S, it sports all-wheel drive, but it's twice as heavy as the Lambo, and it sells for about a third of the price. Our short drag is just long enough for both cars to reach 62 miles per hour, the industry standard for measuring acceleration. Now, both cars are in their fastest setups, and whatever happens today, we recommend you don't try this at home. We have several safety measures in operation. First of all, Johnny is a professional racing instructor here at Drift Limits. He does this day in, day out to scare the living daylights out of members of the public. In the passenger seat will be Mark, ensuring fair play and probably screaming his head off. And who can we get to give one of the finest sports cars a run for its money in a Tesla? It's only Top Gear's The Stig. Oh, I'm sorry, The Stig wasn't available, so I'm standing in. Is that OK? It's only clicks Lara Lewington. Drivers, start your engines. Ready? 
passenger here. My job is really simple. I just have to observe and report. Oh! <laughs> I did break a bit early, but I so clearly won. I'm no expert, but that was no contest. Thank you, I was not expecting to beat you. <laughs> oh my <laughs> word! What? Oh no! <laughs> I can't believe it, absolutely smashed me. That, that was, was so much fun. That was brilliant. Oh, congratulations, Johnny. Commiserations. <laughs> Listen, you're a professional racing driver. In your opinion, why did that beat this? I know, it's absolutely mad, isn't it? I can't <laughs> believe it. It, it. all boils down to the fact that that is electric. So the power band is completely linear. It's always there. It's instantaneous. And to be fair, in the Lamborghini, what three gears to rattle through? Whereas that, just straight line, boom, all the way. Over this kind of a distance, it doesn't really stand a chance, to be honest. It's always going to be the Tesla, hands down. Johnny, thanks. What's that? Did you miss it? Did you blink? All right, here it is again. Three, two, one, go! Hello, and welcome to The Week in Tech. It was the week that Twitter admitted it let third-party advertisers see personal details provided for account security. The firm said it's addressed the problem, but did not say how many users had been targeted. Apple approved and then blocked a controversial Hong Kong protest app, following mounting pressure from China. The crowdsourced app tracks police patrols and tear gas use amidst political unrest in the region. And the brains behind the lithium-ion battery won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry nearly 30 years after their invention first hit the market. The battery tech created by John B. Goodenough, M. Stanley Whittingham and Akira Yoshino today powers everything from mobile phones and laptops to electric cars. Global professional racing club, the Drone Racing League, unveiled its first ever autonomous drone. This features four cameras, four propellers, and an NVIDIA processor. Programmers are set to battle their AI systems, with the winner taking on a human pilot. And finally, how about a spot of lab-grown space meat? Israeli cultured steak startup Aleph Farms joined partners to help astronauts on the International Space Station grow the first ever space beef, 248 miles from Earth. This isn't ready for human consumption just yet, but who knows, it could taste out of this world. Light bulbs in our homes, planes that take us on holiday. Navigating the modern world leaves a lasting impression on our planet. In the UK, a third of emissions are produced by gas guzzlers on the ground and in the air. So the move to electric vehicles should help reduce our carbon footprint. Power stations rather than petrol pumps provide the fuel for electric vehicles. But is this enough to help us save the planet? The mixture of fuels used in national power grids varies by country. Poland, for instance, gets most of its electricity from burning fossil fuels, whereas France's power stations are nuclear, leading to a much lower carbon footprint. The UK's power stations are fueled by a mixture of fossil fuels, nuclear and renewables. So there's still work to be done to reduce carbon-emitting power stations. It's not simply about switching to electric cars. But even when you account for that, and even when you account for all the energy and materials and resources that are going into manufacturing the batteries, the total footprint, the life cycle footprint per kilometer of an EV is on average lower than an internal combustion engine vehicle. As long as you're charging vehicles when there is plentiful wind and nuclear and sun generating on the system, actually electric cars get cleaner and cheaper by that very nature. But if everybody scraps their fossil fuel burning motor in favour of an electric set of wheels, would the grid really be able to cope? If we make the assumption that people plug in their vehicles when they come home, 
then what we find is that peak requirement means that we need something like 15 to 20 uh, large power stations having to come along for, for that period. If we move to a system where actually we shape when the charging actually happens within the vehicle, we can more than adequately cover the total energy required for you to do your daily journeys. It just happens slightly later in the evening or, or early in the morning. If we're really going to embrace a cleaner, carbon emissions free world, we may have to think about transport completely differently. There's some things that are still true, even in a world to electric. It's better to walk, it's better to cycle, it's better to take public transit. If you're gonna take a car, take a small car. If you're gonna take a car that's small, also take a small electric car. These things all still apply. Of course, a big part of the green equation is about recycling. So Mark's been investigating what happens to the batteries when they fade or when the car's headed for the scrap heap. Most of the major motor manufacturers are guaranteeing the life of the batteries in their new EVs for eight years or 100,000 miles. Some researchers suspect the lithium ion batteries used in electric vehicles could last much longer than that though. Ultimately, we are going to have to deal with the batteries at the end of their useful life. Uh, not only will we have to deal with the batteries as a waste problem, the batteries themselves contain valuable materials, critical materials, and so it really is very much in our interests to try and recover these and reuse them as many times as we can. The UK's government has tasked the Faraday Institution, an independent national battery research institute, with accelerating EV growth through innovations in battery technology. Birmingham University is leading a project on battery recycling in partnership with Faraday. There's every reason to think that we can actually improve and make these uh, uh, processes a lot more efficient. And that's important because the whole point, of course, of the electric revolution is to stop CO2 emissions. At the moment, there are only a few places in the world which are able to recycle EV lithium ion batteries. Umacore in Belgium has the capability to recycle batteries from devices like laptops and mobile phones. It's added EV batteries to its repertoire of recyclables. It's basically a, a combination of hydro and uh, pyrometallurgy. Uh, it's a unique in-house built process and actually we're able to refine cobalt, nickel, lithium and uh, copper and also residue of rare earth elements. And these metals, uh, they can infinitely be recycled, they don't lose any of their qualities and they can easily be reused in new applications. Recycling old electric car batteries might seem like the most obvious thing to do with them, but just because their days out on the open road might be over, that doesn't mean that the batteries themselves can't still be useful. Old Nissan Leaf batteries are helping to power parts of this stadium in Amsterdam. The same kind of technology could be used to power homes or even be used as power supplies in disaster zones. Many of the batteries, once they come out of a vehicle, now that, that's quite important if, if you're actually trying to drive a car, but that they're still perfectly good for another 10 years in other energy storage applications. Whether it's recycling or reuse, all of these technologies could help make motoring considerably more environmentally friendly. That was Mark Chislak on the huge amount of work that still needs to be done to recycle the batteries inside electric cars. Right, this is Vicky Parrott. Hello. Vicky Parrott is a long time motoring journalist and now you specialise in electric cars and you're here to answer some of your questions. So let's jump in the Jag. So Vicky, earlier we heard that battery warranties are eight years, yep. which I guess is good news, but do you think it should be the worry of the owner? That these batteries might not last much longer than that. Do you think in the future we might start leasing cars instead of owning them? Uh, no more so than we do already. A lot of people lease cars whether they're electric or not these days and I would add um, most electric cars have battery warranties of eight years and a hundred thousand miles but that doesn't mean that you have to throw the car away after that. Battery life is proving to be very good in electric cars and the warranty is there for peace of mind. It isn't there to say that after eight years your car's not going to work anymore. We received quite a few questions from our viewers saying that they lived in apartments or blocks of flats 
they don't have private parking, they park on the street, so how do they charge an electric vehicle? If you can't charge at home, if you don't have off-street parking, or some apartments these days do have hubs being built in, um, then I'm afraid you just have to check. Possibly zapmap.com is great for telling you where charges are, and you just have to decide whether you can rely on those public charges or not. Here's a really popular question. I want to know the answer as well. How much does it cost to fill up an electric car compared to a, a, a petrol tank? On average, say, a 50 kilowatt hour battery, that's going to cost about £7 to fill up at a normal domestic charger at your house. Now, how many miles would you get for that, do you think? Well, it depends. For instance, the new Renault Zoe will do about 200 miles in real-world driving, and that has a 52 kilowatt hour battery, so that works out around about sort of three or four pence per mile and an equivalent diesel or petrol car is going to be looking at more like sort of 11 to 15 pence per mile so it is usefully cheaper it's half if not a third cheaper have we got enough charging stations in the uk we have a lot of charging stations in the uk i think at the moment it stands at about 10,000 stations and about 26,000 actual charging plugs i think probably we still need more certainly in rural parts especially but it isn't that bad an infrastructure these days. A petrol car will drive further if it's motorway driving than it will if it's urban driving. Is that the same with electric cars or is one mile just one mile regardless of where it's done? No, it's flipped actually. It's one of the things that can catch people out with electric cars. So electric cars are less efficient on the motorway than they are around town because you get less brake regen uh, and actually the electric motor is spinning much faster on the motorway because it doesn't have gears. So you get less range on the motorway than in town. Well. Vicky, thanks for your time, thanks for the ride, thanks for the info. Pleasure. All right. Now, we've just got time left in the show to check out a brand new set of charging stations. Dan has been to see Europe's fastest in Milton Keynes. Beware, Spen. Not all electric cars charge up at the same rate. Not so important right now as most of the 10,000 or so charging stations in the UK offer a fairly slow fill-up time. But a new set of chargers promise to fill your batteries at a stupidly rapid pace. If you bought a car that can handle it. Most of the UK's fast charging stations operate at about 50 kilowatts. Now that's enough to fill a family car up to about 80% in roughly 45 minutes, depending on conditions. These new superchargers though, promise to cut that time to just eight minutes. We're saying that high power charging will be identical to petrol engine cars. There will be no difference. It'll be easy, simple and seamless. But there's a catch. Not one of these new electric cars released this year are built to take a charge that quickly. Although the pump will automatically reduce the power to match what the vehicle can manage. So this current car on sale now will charge at 150 kilowatts uh, in around 30 minutes or just under. Further down the line in about a year's time there'll be another vehicle that comes that will sell. Uh, which can do that in under 10 minutes with this much faster charger. 40 of these souped-up charging stations will roll out across the UK between now and the end of next year, offering many EV motorists a much quicker charge, even if it'll take a year or two before they can be used on full power. And I'm afraid that's all the time we have to talk electric. Are you convinced it's time to switch? Or do you still have some doubts? Let's continue the conversation on social media. We are on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter at BBC Click. Thanks for watching this special programme and we'll see you soon.